All right, I'll begin. Dearly Father, we thank you uh, for this day. Again, we thank you for these students. We pray that you'd uh, guide our thoughts today, help us to uh, glorify you, learn what we do learn. In the name I pray. Amen. Yeah, so I, um, I've not written the syllabus, <laughs> uh, I, so that's why it's not posted. Um, that's a pretty straightforward reason. Um, and, um, but I can tell you that this course will be about applied linear algebra, and um, there will be tests. Won't be too much turned in homework. Um, we'll have two, two computer projects in here. Um, there probably will be, what I'm thinking right now is I'll probably have two big homeworks. I will call them missions, as is my custom. Um, and those will be worth some significant portion of the grade, probably 100 points or something. It'll probably be like 250 point missions if I had to guess. But I haven't put the syllabus together yet, so I should just, when I write it, I'll tell you the point values. But, um, you know, we'll get there. Um, as far as the book goes, um, the homework, so like there's not weekly homework in here, but I recommend you do homework, like I recommend you pass this course, um, to quote my brother. It's like, you mean the homework's recommended, we don't have to turn it in? And Bill will be like, yeah, just like I recommend you pass the course. So, <laughs> it's a good thing. Anyway, um, I, I do want you to pass, but we're using this book, which is Applied Linear Algebra and Matrix Analysis by Thomas S. Shores. I should wrap up chapter one today. So for those of you who are adding, who added late and somehow didn't know about our clandestinely arranged class last week, um, you just somehow weren't in on it. Good news, we taped them and they're on YouTube so you can catch up. So um, I shall add a link. I mean, if you don't want to wait for my link, you can just go to my YouTube channel. You'll find the playlist for Applied Linear Algebra without too much trouble, I think. But um, I will add a link to the Applied Linear Algebra playlist in my YouTube channel. So you can find it there, and now you'll be able to see what we did last week. Um, now, so what we did last week, let me just talk about it. <laughs> we did two things. Day one, we talked about how to solve systems of equations using what's called row reduction. All right, I'm gonna do more of that today. And then Thursday, we talked about complex arithmetic. We talked about the polar form of a complex number. We talked about how to solve a, um, a complex equation using um, nth roots of unity and so forth. Now this is, this is all in here, it's in chapter one, and so I'm more or less just following the book. We're, we'll, we should be done with chapter one today if I don't say something stupid and waste my time on it. Um, so that's where we are. Now in terms of upcoming events, we have a quiz coming up next Tuesday, <clears throat> which will be on chapter one. So, you know, um, I'll probably post Dr. Uh, Dr. Smith's slides, which have kind of a rough overview of what he intended for the course. I'm kind of trying to follow what he did more or less. This isn't my typical course where I have week by week homework and I have a mountain of things for you to do. It's a little bit more kind of laid back, but I do expect you to work, right? But I'm not gonna poke you and tell you to do all these things. You just need to, well, Dr. Smith has good advice. He says, do all the homework you can bear and then do two more. So that's, that's pretty good advice. I guess it's kind of like exercise, but I wouldn't know. And um, so, all right. No, I suggest you do homework problems. So as far as I know, I haven't seen any, I mean, I looked through the homework in here, nothing really stood out to me like I should get rid of that one. You know, and even the ones I talked myself out of, I talked to Dr. Smith for a minute, and he's like, yeah, but blah, 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 blah. And I was like, oh, yeah, so you shouldn't rule out that problem. So I don't know, I mean, they're all good. Um, all right, so <clears throat> continuing last class, sorry for those of you who are not on board yet, but, um, Maybe you'll be able to make sense of it. I wanted to give a concrete example. So basically we looked at, what was it? I'm trying to remember the letter I used. Was it W to the N equal to Z? So we looked at W to the N equal to Z and we figured out that the solutions are a set of things and the set of things were like the, the nth root of Z and then let me call this thing alpha because it gets tiring to write that 30 times. So it's like alpha and then alpha omega, alpha omega squared, da 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 da, alpha omega to the n minus one. Where again, alpha is the nth root, principal nth root, the nth root of z, and omega is what's called the, uh, uh, excuse me, this is, 
and omega is the principal nth root of unity. So I use like omega sub n last time. It's the exponential of 2 pi i over n. I wonder why this board is down. Okay. And we, we worked this out. We derived this. This is the, this is the this is sort of the generic result. Now here, the way we defined the, um, the nth root of, of z, we said what you do is you take the length of the complex number, you take the ordinary nth root of that, and then you take e to the i theta and you divide by n. So here where we discussed that z was equal to the modulus of z times z to the i theta. I'm being deliberately a little bit ambiguous here. If you use software, depending on what you look at, a lot of people would say minus pi, less than theta, less than pi. This is like typical choice of theta. In Shor, Shor's book, he's got something like zero, less than theta, less than two pi. This is Shor's convention. So, I mean, it doesn't really matter what you pick as long as you pick something. If you pick something and then you multiply it by omega, omega squared, da da da, omega n minus one, you'll obtain the same solution set. So it doesn't really matter which theta you choose. You've got to choose, make a choice and stick with it. Let me work an example of this because that's the thing I didn't get to last time and it'd probably be good for us to see one example at least. So suppose I want to find all solutions to let's say um, w to the fifth equals to, I don't know, let's say um, I guess we can just go with one plus i. That's interesting enough. Yep i is the square root of minus one. It is a complex number, an imaginary number, in fact, such that i squared equals to minus one. Fun fact, this notation is introduced by Euler in 1777. That really has no bearing on the class, but I happen to remember this worthless piece of information. Um, so that notation goes back to Euler, who, well, he found a lot of the things that we enjoy torturing students with, I'm sorry, that we like to study. Um, <clears throat> so, all right, so I'm just, I wanna walk you through it. So first of all, I have to take the z, I need to take z equals to one plus i and put into polar form. So it's just what it sounds like, um, just to graph for a second. One plus i is basically here. So the distance from the origin is what we called the modulus of z last time. So this is the complex plane. So one plus i basically corresponds to the point one comma one. It's the square root of two away from the origin, right? And what's the theta for this point? Yeah, we learned last time that this point, so like the distance from the origin would be this thing, which is called the modulus of z. And this theta would be the standard angle. I guess I should also tell you, since we have so many people missing last time, e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta. So anyway, again, all of these things are in chapter one. But, um, <clears throat> okay, so long story short, what do we got? We got z equals to the square root of two, right? Times e to the i what? Right, pi over four. Okay, so now I can calculate what's the nth root, rather not the nth root, I wanna find the what? N equals five here, right? So I'm trying to calculate the fifth root of that. 
So the fifth root of z is going to be the fifth root, so I take the square root of 2, the fifth root of that, all right, and then I do e to the i pi over 4 times what? Times, times 5. So let's see here, this is really 2 to the 1 tenth, um, e to the i pi over 20. You can take this complex number, all right, let me call this thing alpha. You can check that alpha to the fifth power is in fact equal to 1 plus i. That has to be true by our, by our general argument from last time. So what are all the solutions? So the solutions um, to, uh, you know, w to the fifth equal to 1 plus i um, are denoted what they're called. We call it 1 plus i to the 1 fifth power. So I know this is kind of new. We make a distinction in complex analysis between, between this thing, which is a single, a single thing, the fifth root of z, versus this, which is a set of values. So we make a distinction between these two notations for a complex quantity. Yeah. How did you get um, z is equal to square root of 2? Because the distance from the origin to that point is square root of 2. There's a triangle. It has side length 1, side length 1. 1 squared plus 1 squared is 2, square root of 2. So how did you, okay, then how did you get the coordinates of the point? To one. Because one, one, plus, 1 plus i geometrically is identified with 1 comma 1. Okay. That's all. So, I mean, basically 1 is 1, 0, and i is 0, 1. This is the correspondence. So the, the complex number, a plus ib, geometrically corresponds to the, to the Cartesian point, a comma b. We can think of every point in the Cartesian plane as a complex number. Or if you want, you can think about complex numbers as two-dimensional vectors. The magnitude of the two-dimensional vector is, is, is modulus of z, that's the length of the vector, and then the direction of the vector is given by the standard angle theta. So if you've had physics, you could also think of e to the i theta as like the, the unit vector of the, of, the, of the thing. I mean, if I was to think of this as z vector, I could write z vector as modulus of z times z hat in my notation, where z hat is a unit vector that points in the direction of, of, of z so this is the magnitude, e to the i theta is actually the direction vector. Okay. These things we can also say. I don't know if they matter to us much though. Um, I mean, definitely I'm saying more than we need because I'm trying to follow the book. He, he says, I mean, honestly, our ultimate goal is to make you guys comfortable with solving complex polynomial equations later. Okay. So we're just, we're doing a little bit of basic complex arithmetic to try to be more familiar with complex numbers, basically is our goal. Now you say, well, what does this have to do with polynomials, right? So this is one solution. You can, you can try taking this alpha and raising it to the fifth power. I think given the questions today, it's probably a useful productive exercise for us to do that. So if I take, let's, let's check that it works. Two to the one tenth, e to the i, pi over 20, what happens if I raise this to the fifth power? My claim is if I raise this to the fifth power, I'll get back to 1 plus i. Is that going to work? So we get 2 to the 5 over 10 times e to the i pi over 20. Now one of the things we can prove about this, this new thing, this imaginary exponential, is that it still satisfies usual laws of algebra. So like when I have exponential raised to the fifth power, we still just multiply the five inside. Um, this is called de Mauvoir's theorem. Or, oh, sorry. Two to the five tenths is what? There you go. So that's square root of two. And this is what? This is e to the i pi over four, right? Now, e to the i pi over four is cosine of pi over 4 
plus i times the sine of pi over 4. But that is what? Cosine pi over 4, root 2 over 2, right? Sine of pi over 4, root 2 over 2. Although, you know what? I think it's more fun to write those as 1 over root 2, isn't it? I think that's more fun because then you can see they cancel and you get 1 plus i, right? So it works. Doing this black magic of finding the modulus, <laughs> finding the standard angle, dividing by 5, it does in fact create for you a complex number which when you raise to the fifth power you get back to 1 plus i. All right. Now, what's the rest of the solution set? So the rest of the solution set, um, 1 plus i to the fifth power is equal to, and, and here I don't want to write them out explicitly. So I'll say, I'm, I'm calling this thing alpha, right? So it's like alpha, alpha omega, alpha omega squared, alpha omega cubed, alpha omega to the fourth, and that's it. Where this omega is e to the 2 pi i over 5, which for what it's worth is the cosine of 2 pi over 5 plus i times the sine of 2 pi over 5 which is some sort of awful number, which I don't want to write, much less raised to the fourth power, but there it is. And so, so what good is this? Well, this allows us to factor the polynomial. Like, these are the zeros. So any of these, if you plug them in, these all, they solve what? They solve w to the fifth equals to one plus i, right? Or we could look at them as solving p of w which is w to the fifth minus parentheses one plus i, right? Any of these guys will make p of c, let's say, well, how can I write this more compactly? Um, p of c equal to zero for any c which is in here. So those are zeros to this polynomial, right? There's a factor theorem. If you have a zero to a polynomial, you can factor out x minus that zero. So what this means, guys, is that I can rewrite p of w as w minus alpha times w minus alpha omega. Ah, uh, w is a very bad. Let me, let me use something other than w. Let's say like x. Would that be better? Or z? Maybe not z. Maybe not x. Let's, we need something else. Ah, Pac-Man. So... Pac-Man minus Alpha, Pac-Man minus Alpha Omega, Pac-Man minus Alpha Omega squared, Pac-Man minus Alpha Omega cubed, Pac-Man minus Alpha Omega to the fourth. There you go. We have factored this complex. I'm sorry, that looks awful. Let me change my Pac-Mans to T's. <laughs> That'll look better. So my, my point to you is that we can factor the polynomial Pac-Man is, is, is no good here. It's just hurting us. It's not helping us. So this is, in fact, this is equal to t to the fifth minus one minus i. You can factor t to the fifth minus one minus i as that. That is not, it is definitely something I could not do directly. Like if I just start from this and I go, ah, if I look at that number, I can factor it like this. No, I would never think of that. So this way of thinking gives us a way to factor polynomials that we would otherwise have a lot of trouble with. Anyway, all right, I have now said entirely too much about this part, but I know this is the part you guys probably have the least understanding of, which is why I've burnt a lot of class time on it. So. You shouldn't misconstrue this as being the statement that this is the most important thing in this course. That's not at all what I mean by this lecture. This is a kind of minor point, actually. That's just taking me a lot of time to bring you guys up to speed on. So let's get back to the main event, row reduction. Basic complex arithmetic. Also known as... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
eventually I'll find it. Also known as section 1.2 ensures. So I think he calls it practical complex arithmetic, which might seem ironical to some of you if you allow me a wingism. Let's see here. All right, so let's get back to linear algebra finally. Um, I mean, if this were my course from the start and I had time to think about it, I probably wouldn't talk about complex numbers. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm mixed emotions about this whole discussion in here. The reason we're doing it is because you guys told uh, Dr. Smith in course evaluation, not you guys, but you guys told Dr. Smith in course evaluations that it would have been good to have some discussion of complex numbers before you were asked to do complex arithmetic later in the course. Hence today and your last time. All right. So. Getting back to the main event, linear systems. Of equations. And row reduction. AKA the Gauss Jordan algorithm. All right, so let me just try to work an example to get us started here. So here's an example. Um, I'll keep it really simple. So something like um, x plus 2x, two, rather 2y equals 2. Let's see here, let me think. Um, 5. No, wait a minute. Yeah, 5. And um, let's see here, 2x minus y equal to... I'll just make it whatever. I'm not even thinking about it. So it may, this means the answer may not be nice. Fine. That, that could happen. All right, fine. So this is a system of two equations and two unknowns. You guys can solve this without what I'm showing you, but I'm showing you this as sort of a, an example of the method. So the method is this. We take a system of equations and we convert it to a corresponding matrix, the so-called augmented coefficient matrix. So this is 1, 2, 2, minus 1, and then we got a 5 and a 3. All right. Then what we do is we do so-called elementary row operations. to reduce um, the augmented coefficient matrix, this, to the reduced row echelon form of AB, or the REF, -R -E reduced row echelon form. So what that means, echelon is like stair step, so this is like a, like a reduced stair step, so to speak. Um, what elementary operations are allowed? There are three elementary operations. There's type one, which is a row swap. Type two, um, non-zero scalar multiple, a row. Type three, add multiple of one row to another. These are your three elementary row operations. Row swap, non-zero scalar multiple, and finally um, add a scalar multiple of one row to another. Um, I don't use the notation in Shores. So like Shor's notation for elementary row operations is different than mine. I'm sorry about that, but um, if I, it's just, <laughs> I'm teaching another course in linear algebra. I'm not going to start using two different notations for row, no, row reduction in the same semester. It would make me explode. So I'm not, I just, I just refuse. <laughs> okay. So let's see how this goes. 
here's our starting point. 1, 2, 2, minus 1, uh, and then the 5 and the 3. So the way this works is you look for the top row. If it's got a non-zero element as far left as you can go, you make that the pivot. So what I'm trying to say is if it can be so arranged, you choose the upper left corner position as the first pivot. And then your goal is to clear out the things under it. So here's, here's what we do. We take row 2 minus 2 times row 1. So I got 1, I got 2, I got 5. That gives me 0. Let's see here. Minus 1, minus 4 gives me minus 5. 3 minus 2 times 5, which is what? 3 minus 10 minus 7. What is it? Um, all right, and then the next thing I will do is a type 2 operation. I will take row 2 and divide by minus 5. Um, that will give me 1, 2, 5. I'm not changing anything about row 1. 0, 1, and 7 fifths. All right. At this point, we've reached what's called, this is the RE. Well, it's not, it's, it's, it's an... REF of um, AB. So this is, notice the lack of the extra R. So the REF, this is, is not unique. Depending on how you do the row operations up to this point, you can get different things here. But it's in REF if, well, this is hard. I mean, I'm just going to tell you it's that. I'll give you a more interesting example in a second. Let me just stop saying what it is because there's not enough, this is not a hard enough example to appreciate the difference between REF and RREF. Okay, so let's just, just put that on hold here for a second. <clears throat> there's some kind of balance to be struck here. I want to work an example which is easy enough that we can get through without getting too tired. But on the other hand, I also need an example that's a little bit harder so you can see what's going on. So, so I need two examples is what it boils down to. All right. Next step, the, so we, we have, we're done clearing out below the first pivot column, pivot position. We now go on to the second pivot position. So this is first pivot, also known as lead, leading entry. So here we go. Um, this is the second pivot position. And so what you want to do, and that's already cleared out, there's nothing below it to clear. So at this point we do what's called the backwards pass. We start trying to clear out things above the rightmost pivot position. Um, so to get rid of the two, we do row one minus two times row two. So I get one, I get zero. The seven fifths doesn't change. And let's see here. So I have to have, I'm getting, I'm going to have five minus two times seven fifths for my upper entry there. What's that? 10 minus, wait a minute. 11, oh, 11, thank you. Yeah, 11 fifths. Now, why, why do you do these row operations? Very simple. Row operations correspond to either switching an equation, taking an equation and multiplying it by a non-zero number, or adding one copy of the equation to another, right? None of these things change the solution set. So by doing row operations, we're finding a so-called row equivalent system of equations, which has the same solution set as our original equation. But this thing, which I just found, is called the reduced row echelon form for this problem, our REF of AB. The advantage of the reduced row echelon form is that it is equivalent to a far simpler system of equations. Okay, so like this, this system of, what, what does this mean in terms of equations? So I, I translated from this system of equations to the augmented coefficient matrix over here, right? So now we just have to do the same, tra reverse translate that. What is it? Yeah, these equations are very boring. Um, 1 times x plus, I'll write this, 0 times y equals to 11 fifths. Right? <laughs> and 0 times x plus 1 times y equals to 7 fifths. Now that's a, that's a stupid way to write it. What we're really saying is x is equal to 11 fifths and y is equal to 
7 fifths. In other words, the solution is 11 fifths comma 7 fifths. So this is the solution. It's a unique solution because there's just one of them. All right. What's the solution set here? Now, this is really dumb. It's a singleton. It's the set which just contains this one point. I'm just throwing that out there. I'll ask you to find the solution set to a, to a, to a, to a linear set of a system of linear equations, right? So if I ask that in this kind of problem, all it means is you add curly brackets to the one solution. It's kind of silly. It's more exciting in other examples, like the next one I'll work. Questions? Let me give, yeah. This is just type, this is one of just type one. Let's see here, a type three, a type two, type three, that's it. So you just use all of the elements row operations to get to your final matrix. Yeah, let's, let me make up another example. Um, <coughs> let's see here. How about this? Um, zero, two, two, two. One, zero, one, one. Um, one, um, two, uh, zero, zero. This is, I don't know if this is going to be interesting or not, but I'll, we'll do this one. Let's, let's do the so-called Gauss-Jordan elimination on this, all right? So our goal is always, so um, do you guys know this notation? Like, what's E1? I don't think I've, I'm not sure if I've introduced this in here yet, but E1 is a column vector that's got one up here and it's got zeros underneath. I, first class I introduced it, okay, good. But I should probably reintroduce it again because, yeah, zero, one, zero, and so forth. Um, we get to EN, if we're talking about N vectors, we got zeros all the way down except for one in the last spot. So like more generally speaking, if we look at EI, we look at the jth component of it, it's Kronecker delta IJ. The Kronecker delta IJ is one if I is equal to J, and it's zero if I is not equal to J. So that's these, these are called the so-called standard basis. Um, for RN. RN is the set of N, tup N tuples of real numbers. R2 is the plane, R3 is like three, you can think of it as three dimensional space, you know. So what I'm trying to get at here, the reason I'm introducing these is just to tell you, when we're done with the Gauss-Jordan elimination, what we'll have is each pivot column is E1 or E2 or E3 and so forth, it goes over. So like in this last example, we did the row reduction and after we were done, we had our first pivot column was E1, our second pivot column was E2. And that's how it works. So I'm not sure what's going to happen here yet. We'll see. But our first pivot column has to be E1. That's the rule. That's the algorithm. And so in order to do that, I got to switch rows, right? So w which one do you want to swap? Middle one. Middle, middle one? Okay. As you can see, that, see but right there, there's a choice, right? Um, now you're saying swap row one and row two, and that's fine. That's not wrong. But my point to you is you could just as well have swapped row three and row one. And everything that happened after that would be a different sort of adventure, right? So we chose our adventure though, we're gonna stick with it. What I'm claiming though, guys, is if you chose differently, at the end of it, after everything's done, we'd still get to the same reduced row echelon form. Okay, so there's our type, our type one row op. Now we have our pivot position. We can start pivoting, <laughs> so to speak. First pivot position. So I need to clear out that. So to clear that out, pretty simple. What do we do? We do row, what do you say, row three minus row one? I couldn't hear you because there was some bizarre noise in the next room. I don't know what it was. Um, Zero two two. It sounded like a an easel dying or something. I don't know. Um, can you
Can eels die? I don't know. It's an inanimate object, but... What's that? Oh! It's the cleaning people cleaning is what it is. Um, cleaning people got to clean. What can I tell you? Um, two. Uh, minus one, minus one. Thank you, Mr. Wynn. I will need help, your help with arithmetic at this hour in the day. This is like my third class on Tuesday, Thursday. And I'm a little bit spent at this point, right? So I will make mistakes in here. That is guaranteed. Of course, they're all for your learning. Um, <laughs> but some of them are unavoidable, yeah. So if you do R3 minus R1, you only change the R3. Right, my nomenclature, my notation, the way I do it is whichever row I put first for a type 2 or type 3 operation is the one that's modified. So like here, row, I'm swapping out row 3 with original row 3 and row 1. Here, I'm swapping out row 1 with original row 1 minus 2 times row 2. Which one I write first is not an accident. Whichever one I write first is what I'm modifying. That's my notation. Not Shor's notation, my notation. Unfortunately, I'm going to give you guys a handout. Um, but it, I don't know, is it, it's actually not unfortunate. Like part of your, what do you want to learn as, as potential engineers or teachers or whatever it is you're planning to be is how to read different notation from different people and be able to translate from one to the other. And that's like an important skill actually. So I'm providing some of that sort of job training for you in that I'm going to completely rip off Dr. Smith's um, first project. And his notation for raw operations is a little bit, little bit different. It's based on the get, something gets something, which is a programming thing. So his notation is more in tune with um, the coding you'll need to do for the first project. So it's actually a good thing. Um, but we'll talk more about that some other day. Yeah. That thing you put online, is that the same notation? Um, no, I think the thing I put online, which is my brother's, he actually uses notation which is more in tune with Dr. Smith. Okay. Which I think basically the difference is what's written last is what's being modified. It's kind of exactly backwards to mine. Yeah. So. This is how I think, though. So I'm I'm going to tell you this way. You you can use, you can use either notation. Fortunately, my brother, I think the way Bill would write this, is well. Let me not let me let me not do it because if I do it wrong, then I'm going to really regret it right now. So let me not. But the the, the 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 larger difference is Bill writes this with something over it for his notation for row ops. So there's no there shouldn't be any confusion. If you see this, we're using the convention of my brother which also I believe is the convention of Dr. Smith. If you see this, you know it's me being myself, doing it the way I've learned for about five years. So it's ingrained for me at this point. I used to write um, R, R3 maps to R3 minus row one like that. I used to write all this, but then I realized I don't need to write all that if I just always put the modified row first in the formula, it's less to write and it still has all the same information. But from a sort of programming, from a programming perspective, the thing I wrote in blue is a little bit, you know, more close to how you program it. I mean, I've been wanting to talk about programming at the moment. Let's, let's get back to here. So, okay, fine. First pivot is done. We've cleared out everything under it. So we move on our second pivot. So what you want to do is you go to the next row. Down. You forget, my brother would say, you forget about the first row and you look at the rows below. You try to pick the next row below and you try to make it, you know, you try to find a leading entry and we can do that. So here, the next pivot is two. And then we want to clear out below that. I'm not going to do anything because it's already matching up. So I'm just going to like, it's kind of nice. I don't have to do any kind of much thinking. Row three minus row two. And let's see here, that gives me zero, zero. Minus three, minus three, right? Now at this point, I'm gonna rescale the third row to make it prettier. So I'll start down here, I'll say um, row three divided by minus three, which gives me what? So row one and row two unchanged, one, zero, one, one, zero, two, 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 zero, what is it? He's, he's just being himself as usual. Let's hear. Um, I mean, I guess who else would you be, right? But, uh, so that's nice. Why, why didn't you just take the third uh, matrix and just divide 
I mean the third matrix, and just divide R2 by R3. You divide R2 by R3. I don't know what that means. You're asking me why didn't I divide row 2 by 2? Yes. I'll take you up on your offer. Row 2 over 2? Sure, why not? There's not just one way to play this game. Sure, we can do that. It's all good. Now, again, this is what I would call the reduced echelon form of, of this matrix. Let me call it M to give it a name. M is for matrix. Matrix um, means enclosure. I mean, Bill, I, I read this in Bill's handout. I was like, oh, interesting. So it's derived from the Latin for womb, apparently. So like enclosure. So there you go. There's some entomology for you. Wait, is that the right word? It's somewhat ironic to ask if it's the right word, isn't it? Here. So um, I shut up. Now this completes what's called the forward pass. So the forward pass, what you do, you identify the first pivot, you identify the second pivot, and so forth and so on until you're out of pivots. At this point, you've got leading entries with zeros under the pivot positions when the forward pass is done. Then you do the backwards pass. The backwards pass clears out things above the pivot. And then you go from right to left on the backwards pass. It's called the backwards pass for this reason. So my third pivot, this guy, right? And now I want to clear out above. So I'm, I'm going to try to clear out these two ones, right? So since I don't have writing a lot, I'm going to do two row operations at once. I hope you don't mind. So row two minus row three. And I'll also do row one minus row three, right? That gives me what? There you go. And that, folks, is the reduced row echelon form of M. Yeah. Is the REF, is that just when the bottom is cleared out? Like after the first pass? When it's in reduced row echelon form, each of the leading entries, right? Leading entries means you go each row, each non-zero row, when you get to it, that's a leading entry. And then it's a reduced, reduced row echelon form. If above and below each leading entry, you have zeros. Above and below zeros. Above and below, there's no below, but above zeros. In contrast, over here, right, below there are zeros, but above, you got ones. So this is not in reduced row echelon form, it's just an echelon form. An echelon form, I should really say again, because it's not unique. So the and, and REF, mm -hmm. just wherever you have the bottom figured out. Right. Now, now we can ask the question, I just made up a matrix, right? Now we can think about the corresponding system of equations and understand what's the solution here, right? So what, what, what would the original ma matrix correspond to what system of equations? So if I'm, if I'm looking at this as a, as a, well, tell you what, let's look at this. Uh, fun, while we're at it, let's make it more interesting. If I, if I just think of this as a system of equations of um, three variables, right? If I just think about it as a system of equations in x, y, z, we'd have a unique solution of like x equals zero, y equals zero, z equals one. That's boring, it's kind of the example we just did. What's more exciting is to tack on another column of zeros. Can you see what would happen? What if I put another column of zeros here just for, for kicks? How would that change anything? What if I just tack on another column of zeros? Right, that's true. In terms of the equation and interpretation, we have an extra variable. My question to you is, would the row operations change that column of zeros as you go on? No, this should draw your attention to something about this, reduced, this gauss stewart elimination. It goes column by column. The columns, in some sense, are isolated, right? Like, I mean, you're not changing. <laughs> whatever, whatever's in column five stays in column five, so to speak, right? I mean, you're swapping things in column five with things in column five, but you're not borrowing things from column four or column six. I mean, talk about column two. Column two.
stays in column two, right? So it's like, it's like Fight Club. Um, I'm sorry, is that too arcane a reference? Let's see here, he hasn't. It's the, uh, oh, wait a minute, it's not Liberty Approved, right? You don't watch that. See here. Is it Liberty Approved? I don't know. What's our, what's our stance on Fight Club these days? I don't know. These are questions I ask. Um, but you can easily see that adding zeros does nothing except ride along, right? And if I do that, then the problem's more interesting in terms of its interpretation. So that's why I'm doing that. Actually, there's, there's, there's you know, two reasons I'm doing it. The one reason is to make it more interesting. The other is just to emphasize, this is something interesting about row, row reduction, is that if we tack a zero on to the end, same reduction, right? So what's the system of equations? This would be like the system of equations 2x2 plus 2x3 plus 2x4 equals to 0. That's the first row. The second row would be something like x1 plus x3 plus x4 equals to 0. The third equation would be x1 plus what? 2x2. Now this system of equations, this system of equations right here, let me call it star, um, this is a homogeneous system, right? Homogeneous systems are very nice. Homogeneous systems in particular always have a solution. They're always consistent. There's always at least one solution to a homogeneous problem as we talked about day one, the zero solution, right? Okay, so that's the original system. What is the row reduce system? I say I've got an x1 equal to zero. I've got what, x2 equal to zero. I've got what, x3 plus x4 equal to zero, right? Those are the equations. All right, so here's what we do. Customarily, we look at this as x3 equals to minus x4. And a lot of times we'll do something like set x4 equals to t, all right? Just to give it a sort of a name divorced from, from x4 for a second. And so with that in mind, we have then what? If x4 is equal to t, x3 is equal to what? Minus t, right. So if we look at a generic solution, x2, x1, x2, x3, x4, it looks like what? It looks like 0 for x1, 0 for x2. Um, x3 we said is minus t and x4, t. What's t? What's that? Anything. Anything? What do you think, Jessica? Uh, it's a parameter or free variable. Oh, parameter, it's a free variable. These things are all true. <laughs> right, t is anything you want. Could be zero, could be three, could be pi, could be minus a million. How many solutions are there? <laughs> exactly, there are infinite many, many solutions here. So the solution set is actually a little bit interesting this time. It's 0, comma, 0, comma, minus t, comma, t, such that t is a real number. So there you go, that's the solution set. Now, sometimes, guys, I don't like introducing this extra thing called t because I think, that's dumb, why should I have to put t there? And so if you feel like I do, then I feel your pain. And I also allow you to write the solution set like this. Like this is totally the same mathematically. 0, 0, minus x4. x4 is x4, such that x4 is a real number. This is, in fact, the same mathematical object. So I'm, I'm introducing the t because a lot of authors will write it that way. So if the solution in the book is written that way, I, I kind of want you to have. But I, I actually like what's in blue more because it kind of better describes the meaning of the parameter. The parameter is x4. Right. Uh, 
you could do that too. Now, now here's where I'm gonna I'm gonna seem a little bit uh, annoying. Um, I would say that this right here is a non-standard answer. Um, now you could say, well, that's ad hoc. In other words, it's just some thing I made up. Fair enough. But it is our convention in this course to write the um, to use the non-pivot columns um, variables as free variables. So what's the non-pivot column here? Right, this right here is our one non-pivot pivot column. Our custom, our custom is to use this variable as a parameter in the solution set. That's exactly why we need to make this custom. Because otherwise I'd go nuts trying to figure out if your answer was equivalent to mine. But if we make this custom, then there's a standard way to write the solution set. Here, let me show you a much worse problem. In fact, now would be a great time to remind you guys about technology. So this, um, I mean, for me, I think I learned row reduction. Like I really finally learned it really, I had, you know, I feel like, well, I had linear algebra in the summer. I must have, I mean, I knew row reduction there, of course, but then I had to do like four by four systems of equations for my um, electrical engineering class I took when I, when I transferred to NC State. Like I was an electrical engineer for a semester. I took DCAC and uh, digital, digital electronics. And then I, I got uninterested in it because every time we ever had any trouble, all the professor would be like, so um, I know you guys are having trouble right now, but you know, when you get out of here, you're gonna start at like $50,000. That's like what you're gonna start at. That's gonna be your starting salary. And it's like, I don't, I don't care. It's not why I'm here. I don't know why it works. And I soon discovered that the engineers that I was exposed to didn't care a inkling about why. They only cared about how. And I pretty much only care about why. How doesn't concern me. So there you go. So that's how I ended up here. I would, I would just start doing that. What'd I do? No, commenting on your video. You go. <laughs> yeah, this, this, I feel like I know this ex student. I feel, I have a sense that this may be the one and only Victor Lemon commenting on this video, but um, it was actually not Victor Lemon. He has a different name, which I will not expose, but he has this Gmail account with the name of Victor Lemon. His real name is something different. I'm like, don't you feel like this is the kind of thing that's going to get you in trouble with the FBI someday? It's like, why do you have this alias that you're like using for years and years and years? <laughs> it's just very sketchy, right? Like, I don't know. <laughs> you're like, we all do this. I'm like, okay, well, I don't, I mean, I don't, although I feel like I should now that I talk about it. What was I going to do? All right. Um, I still need to, I will, uh, the other thing I will do guys is I always have a course web page for each one of the courses I'm teaching. This is a course I'm teaching. So I owe you guys a web page. I don't have it up yet, obviously. Um, there's a lot of in overlap between this and linear algebra, but um, you might have noticed something. What did I prove today? Nothing, Nothing right? And there's the difference. Um, so I will explain in here. I will explain so much that you'll be tired of it. But what I won't do here much is prove. So this is a website which I will provide a link to. It's already linked to my linear algebra page. Um, but we can, we can do something bigger. Like let's say, I don't know, five rows and like, eight columns, that seems exciting. And I don't know. Mm. 
I wonder how many row operations this will take. So this will show you, a, care to guess? 57. We have 57. We have 57. What do we have? 57. We have 57. We have 57. I'm sorry. 25 was the answer. Oh, I regret this. This will not serve. This will not serve my purposes. What I was going to show. I mean, what this means. Here's x1, x2, x3, x4, x5 x6, x7, um, and if we think of this as being, like, if we think of this as an augmented coefficient matrix, the last column corresponds, corresponds to numbers in the final equation. So the parameters will correspond to this one and this one, which in this case would be, so like x6 and x7 will serve as parameters, and we'll be able to write x1 through x5 in, as, as in terms of x6 and x7, and that, here, let me, let me try this again, but being a little bit more careful with my numbers. Um, yeah, let's just go back. Here, let's, let's do a few less rows. Let's do four rows. There we go. All right. I wish I could go column by column. Oh well. You're like. as I know. Oh, are you saying you can do row reduction in the calculator? See, um, I mean, uh, this is one of the reasons graphing calculators are not allowed on tests in here, is because for a very long time you've been able to do a reduction on like a Texas Instruments calculator, which is precisely why we don't allow them on tests. Um, oh, care to guess how many? Uh, ten. Seven. Ooh, 12, sorry. Okay, so the original problem, guys, help me out here. What is it, one, read column by column for me. Two, two, two. Six what? zero. Okay, so think of this as the augmented coefficient matrix of a system. So for example, the last equation in this system would be x1 plus 2x2 plus 3x4 plus 2x5 plus x6 plus